A continuous distillation column has preheated wash added as a liquid between the cooler rectifying column above and the hotter stripping column below. So the stripping column must be heated by other means, which is to add steam at the bottom. This requires a steam generator that is precisely controllable with a constant output. That did not prove to be so simple. My first attempt was a setup like this, which is an adaptation of a pot still with a water containing boiler and heater. Its steam output was controlled by precise control of heater power, but in order to make it continuous, the water has to be constantly replenished. So I set up this system with a cold water header tank that determined the level of water in the boiler, and a silicon tube down the side of the boiler to show that level. That didn't work. The steam supply proved to be highly unstable. Cold water is drawn into the vessel at a constant rate to replenish water boiled off, plus random variations due to pressure variations at the bottom of the vessel caused by boiling. If an unusually large slug of cold water enters the bottom of the vessel as it does every few minutes, the cold water quenches boiling, reduces steam production temporarily, so reducing the pressure in the boiler and column, drawing in more cold water, leading to a positive feedback cycle that completely quenches the boiler. So I tried to solve this problem like this using an intermediate preheater so that the water flowing into the bottom of the boiling vessel was already hot. This somewhat mitigated the problem but did not eliminate it as it simply moved the effect of cold water influx upstream. The generator has to provide constant steam output that does not change with changes in column pressure. Commercial steam generators use high pressure chambers and precise steam release valves but that substantially increases the risk and complications for homemade equipment. So instead I used a flash boiler. The idea here is that the boiler vessel is kept substantially hotter than the boiling point of water. I use 130 degrees Celsius. Water is pumped in at a constant rate. Because the boiler is so hot, water vaporises immediately on contact with the boiler and so the rate of steam generation is controlled by the rate at which water is pumped in and this rate is insensitive to changes in pressure. This solution works well. There are many ways to make such a boiler but I used a copper drinking water bottle as are readily and cheaply available online from India and half filled it with steel ball bearings. I soldered a copper sheet over the top through which a 3mm brass tube passed for water inflow and an 8mm copper tube for steam egress. The materials aren't important, it's just that tubes of those diameters are readily available in those materials and they fit common diameters of silicon tubing. The boiler is heated by an external band heater. I use one of 550 watts. Close to the band heater is a temperature sensor. The whole thing is then lagged to minimise heat losses and keep energy costs down. The reason I have half filled it with ball bearings is to reduce the problem of residue build-up. This does not apply to using distilled water, but that's expensive. Tap water has dissolved solids in it, which are left as a residue inside the flash boiler. Without the ball bearings, the residue would build up at the same point on the bottom of the boiler where the drips from the water inlet land and this would eventually impede heat conductivity to the incoming water. By using ball bearings you get the same effect of the residue building up at the point where the drips land, but you can give it a shake every so often and redistribute the ball bearings and spread out the residue. It doesn't have to be ball bearings, I just happen to have them lying around. Nuts and bolts would do just as well. Initially I tried this using a conventional thermostatic heat control system, but as you may imagine from the heat capacity of the boiler and the conductivity of its walls, this led to wide temperature swings. When switched on from cold, the boiler wall next to the heater heats up rapidly, but that heat is conducted more slowly to the temperature sensor, which therefore lags behind the temperature of the heater. By the time the temperature sensor reached 130 degrees, the walls were a lot hotter. When the heater then switched off, the temperature sensor kept climbing and hit about 200 degrees centigrade before starting to fall. The problem wasn't as bad when it was operating at temperature, but there was still a temperature swing from about 110 to 160 degrees, which would work but was a little worrying as the melting point of the solder I used was only 240 degrees. For that reason, I switched to using a PID controller. 
A simple thermostatic controller turns the heater on when the sensed temperature falls below a set value and turns it off when it's above. The delay in conducting heat from the heater to sensor leads to an overshoot and undershoot that can be substantial. A proportional integral derivative or PID controller solves this problem. It does not switch the heater directly with the sense temperature, but rather switches it with a regular square wave and adjusts the duty cycle according to a function that depends on the difference between the sense temperature and the set point, that is the proportional bit, and integral over time of the difference between the temperature and set point, the integral bit, and a time derivative of this difference, the derivative bit. This function allows the duty cycle to be adjusted accurately and quickly to maintain a constant temperature despite changing heater power requirements. For applications like maintaining the temperature of fermentation where there is a large specific heat capacity and a relatively small heater power, thermostatic control works OK with temperature variations typically around 1 degree. However, with a flash boiler there is a high power and low heat capacity and temperature swings are wide, making PID control necessary. Though in any situation, PID control gives more precise temperature regulation. In this case, PID control allows the temperature of the flash boiler to be maintained within 1 degree of 130 centigrade. A safety critical point to note here is that the still is designed to be operated continuously unattended and it must therefore fail safe. Inexpensive commercial thermostatic and PID temperature controllers switch heaters using relays and relay contacts have a limited life, particularly when switching high powers because switching causes arcing at the relay contacts which slowly degrades their coating. Ultimately, this leads the contacts to weld together after typically 50,000 operations. That means that these relays fail on rather than off. If a flash boiler like this suffers such a failure, it will lead to dangerous overheating with a substantial risk of melting or fire. PID controllers turn the heater on and off more frequently than conventional thermostatic controllers, which will further reduce the life of relays, and therefore relays cannot be used for switching, and instead should be replaced with solid-state relays when alternating current is being used for the heater power, or power MOSFETs if it's direct current. These do not have a limited cycle life and also fail off, not on. Many PID controllers like this have terminals on the back specifically for controlling solid state relays. If they don't, like this one, it's fairly easy to get inside and solder a wire to the positive side of the relay coil and bring it out to the gate of the MOSFET or solid state relay. Unlike ordinary relays, solid state relays and MOSFETs dissipate heat, which will need a heat sink if more than a couple of amps are being switched. For an extra layer of safety against some other malfunction leading to the controller failing on, a thermal cutout or thermal fuse rated at 180 to 200 degrees and mounted on the surface of the flash boiler can be included in series with the heating element. The steam output of the flash boiler is controlled via the rate of water input, and there are a number of options for this. I have been using a stepper motor peristaltic roller pump driven by a programmable signal generator controlled by a Raspberry Pi. The signal generator uses a quartz oscillator reference so it is precise and stable, as is the stepper motor. The same cannot be said for the pump, which is OK for this application but not perfect. I'm planning a more detailed video on pumps, but there are alternatives such as constant flow gravity fed systems like this. With my continuous still setup, the pressure at the bottom of the column is between about 5 and 7 centimetres of water above atmospheric. And you want to set up the feed system so that it's insensitive to pressure changes of that magnitude. A gravity fed system is based on a header tank with a flow resistor or needle valve and then a drop to the injector point. You vary the flow by either raising or lowering the header tank or adjusting the needle valve or both. It needs to be high enough that the pressure inside the column is a negligible component of the head of water in the feed system, and this means you need a metre or more head of water. I have dabbled with this, but I started with the peristaltic pump system and so don't yet have much experience of it. I plan to post on that and the performance of a couple of precision gear pumps I've recently purchased from eBay when I have more to say.